And it, we took that decision yet again on the so-called precautionary principle, regardless of whether the precautions were doing more harm than, uh, than the thing we were trying to take precautions against. And one of the things that is very evident about the ozone layer, just come out recently, is an admission on the part of the scientists who did the original calculations that they had overestimated by around tenfold the effect of CFCs on disrupting the ozone layer. So once again we see they went along, they exaggerated, whether by mistake or by design, we don't need to know, they just got it wrong, they didn't check, nobody else checked because it became the fashionable thing to do. They banned chlorofluorocarbons and the ozone, layer, uh, ozone holes, I should say, over the Antarctic in particular, tend to wax and wane and they often do so with suspiciously close correlation to the eruptions of the intermittent volcano Mount Erebus, which is the largest active volcano in that region. And, of course, what do volcanoes do? They emit enormous amounts of chlorofluorocarbons. And, indeed, one really good eruption can emit as much as humankind was emitting in a year. But that is, therefore, it's one of those unsettled debates where the world decided to act anyway, and because it was only one minor industry that got shut down, people were willing to override it and just do that. Then they thought they could, having done that as a kind of trial run, they thought they could now shut down the entire economies, selectively of the West, of course, this is always what seems to happen here, by saying that global warming is a problem. And there is one interaction between ozone and global warming, because it has been suggested that the absence of the... Uh, ozone over the Antarctic was what, by some mechanism I never quite understand, had caused the cooling of Antarctica, and that now that the ozone layer was repairing itself, we were going to get global warming in Antarctica, <laughs> and all the ice would be melting again. <laughs> Yay, verily. Yeah. There's a gentleman here. <laughs> I'd like to refer to your first slide that you commence this with uh, and ask you, would you advise those politicians who are going to enter, make a decision on our ETS in a couple of weeks' time and tell them that we in Australia don't need an ETS anytime, anyhow? Thank you. I think that is an excellent point, and I will very briefly say why we don't want an ETS. Now, of course, it's not for me to tell you what you want in your country, but let me say why I think an ETS is a bad idea. And it is this, that if you put the price of emitting a tonne of carbon dioxide high enough to deter people from emitting carbon dioxide you will fatally damage your economy and shut it down. And you will transfer your workers' jobs and your businesses to places like China, where their emissions per unit of production are higher than here. So paradoxically, you first of all kick your own workers in the ghoulies and you add to the carbon emissions of the planet at the same time. So that's that end of it. And on the other end, on the other end, if you don't set a high enough price on a tonne of carbon to make any difference to the amount of emissions, all you're going to do is make absolute bankers rich. Does anyone here want that? No, well done. <laughs> the lady up... The, yes, that lady right up the back. Thank you. I should probably apologise. Mine's quite a simple question. At the beginning of your talk, you spoke about how we were coming out of an ice age and that was why temperatures, we would expect them to be warmer. But then later on, I think you said that it was cooler, and I was just not sure how those... Right, like, could you summarise that for me, because I think I misunderstood. Certainly, yes. Uh, it is complicated, because you've got temperatures jiggling up and down. That's what's meant by a stochastic data set. It's one where we can't predict which way the temperature is going to jump next, so you get that jiggly line that I was showing you on, on the chart several times. And what has happened is that over the past 300 years since roughly 1695, and how can I date it that exactly? Because there was, in fact, already an instrumental temperature record in central England at that time. We know that from 1695 until 1735, a period of 40 years in central England, temperatures rose by 2.2 Celsius degrees, compared with just 0.6 Celsius degrees in the whole of the 20th century. 
And that period of very rapid warming was because the planet, and therefore central England, was recovering from what is called the Maunder Minimum, a period of 70 years from 1645 until 1715, during which there were almost no sunspots on the sun, and we infer, because we didn't then have the kind of magnetometers we have now to measure the solar magnetic activity, we infer that solar uh, magnetic activity went down to a very low level indeed, much as is now being shown on the AP, Planetary Index of Solar Activity, which is at its lowest level at the moment since measurements began 166 years ago. But the temperature has risen for 300 years, broadly speaking, on a rising trend. Of course, in that uh, period, it will have gone up and down. And in fact, in around 1995, it pretty much stopped rising. There was a peak in 1998 caused by what's called the Great El Nino of that year, when the ocean gave up quite suddenly a large amount of heat from its depths and threw it into the atmosphere. And that happens every three or four years, an ordinary El Nino, but a really big one like that, once every 150 years, it causes coral bleaching, it causes various other effects, none of which are particularly harmful. And that gave you a peak temperature in 1998. There has been no year since 1998 with a temperature that high. I prefer to do my measurements from the 1st of January 2001 because that's the beginning of the new millennium and it's well clear of the distorting effect of the Great El Nino of 1998. And as I showed you on the graph, there has been a decline in temperatures for nine years since 2001. But of course you will get these declines in temperatures in an overall rising trend, which is what we have seen over the past 300 years. So that is how I explain it. It's a little bit complicated, but roughly speaking, uh, don't worry. The temperatures we are seeing, the changes we've seen in temperature over the last 300 years are not exceptional, though the change in solar activity from solar minimum to solar maximum over the past 300 years is exceptional. Indeed, it's unprecedented in the last 11,400 years and may well have quite a lot to do with the warming of the last 300 years. Thank you. Good answer. There's a lady down here. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I wasn't able, unfortunately, to follow all the science as you briefly um, showed those uh, yes. slides. And I was wondering if you'd published the fundamental scientific basis of what you're saying somewhere so that one could read it in the quietitude of one's own... Uh, Yes, of course. That's a very good question. If you go to www.scienceandpublicpolicy.org, that's the website where I publish a lot of the work that we do researching into this and trying to explain it in layman's terms. There are one or two technical papers there, but they're in a separate technical section. The rest of it is more or less in layman's terms, and with a little bit of work, you'll be able to understand what we're saying, and that's the place you'll find the data. You'll also find a blog, which we started recently. We started it during Copenhagen, actually. That's at www.sppiblog.org, where we discuss also some of these ideas, and we also regularly answer questions from people who read our blog, and they write in and say, can we explain things? And then we do our fumbling best to do just that. All right, we'll just get that. That's www.scienceandpublicpolicy.org. That's it? Just a a, a subsidiary to that question. I know that uh, this is being... Uh, videoed today, is there any intention, I, th- I think I'm right in saying that, aren't I? And is there any intention in, in of you and the organisers to still distribute that video because there are thousands of people who can't be here who are very interested in what actually is happening? Right, can we take a vote? All those who would like a video of this to be distributed say aye. 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 Come on, I want somebody to say, Amen. Uh, amen. <laughs> That's it. All those against, carried. We'll do that. Okay, there's a gentleman here in the middle. Thank you. Yeah. On the point of global government, uh, recently in the media, well actually for a long time, since about 1991, uh, a lot of politicians such as um, George Bush, uh, also Sarkozy, Merkel, Gordon Brown himself, and Ho- Obama himself in a different way. He's, he's, there's a term called the New World Order. They say, we need a New World Order. 
is that this global government that, that all the talking about and um, is it 